All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 7th day of February in the year of our Lord, 2024. Yikes, an election year. Um, I want to say something about that, maybe. Okay. Let me just offer a thought here. I, You know, the scripture, Paul talks about not putting stumbling blocks in the way of people. He says uh, in one place, he says, I become all things to all men in order that my, I might by all means win some. And I was thinking about that a little bit in regard to, well, election years and Christians and what we should and should not do on the Internet as Christians, perhaps. Just something for your consideration. I'm not... My flesh wants to... <laughs> I get triggered. I'm debating whether I should even be on, uh, on X or Twitter at all. I need to discipline myself to to not. I I think it can function, and I know some people use it for that uh, as a place to post information. But I should think perhaps I should not actually look at what's on Twitter because I want to respond, and I think social media, especially short form social media like Twitter. And I'm sure TikTok and some other things out there like that. I don't know anything about. I don't have a TikTok account. <laughs> what would I want one for? Uh, but um, I do not think Twitter is a place to have a conversation. Uh, first of all, 240 characters, unless you want to spend ten dollars a month, uh, which just gives you four thousand characters, I believe, is not suitable and. The, the nature of social media seems to be to, the purpose of it is to generate an emotional response rather than carefully thought out discussion. Just like debates, they're useless. It's like if I wanted to debate somebody on YouTube, but I would say, okay, you do a video and I'll do a response and we can go back and forth. And, you know, every several days post a video. That gives you time to pray, to think, to consider, and prepare a response. See, de debates, your typical debate is nothing more than an intellectual game. It's a sporting event. It is not substantive. It doesn't have a true purpose other than team sports. You know, my, my, does my side win or not? That is not uh, what we need, not as Christians especially. So I was thinking, it, it, when it comes to electing uh, you know, the people in power, we, we, we're living in a world that's gone, to ma uh, gone mad. It's simply mad. Uh, if we're going to participate in the politics at all, in the United States, as Christians, uh, remembering the overriding purpose of Christ is to call sinners to repentance and salvation. And when we enter into politics, we tend to alienate people, don't we? So, you know, we want to say some things about the current president, perhaps that would alienate his supporters. But Christ isn't saying things about the current president or the future president. Uh, so no matter what side you pick, you're going to alienate a large portion of the country. 
and perhaps they won't listen to what you have to say about Jesus Christ because of that. So, if you're going to be talking about Jesus Christ on the internet, perhaps you shouldn't talk about politics. Other than, you know, if we're going to talk about politics as Christians, uh, as far as uh, edifying others, rather than saying who they should or should not vote for, we should maybe educate in principles of how to decide who you should vote for. Principles that come from the scripture, like do not consider only your own interests, but also the interests of others. That might be edifying for the country in general. Realizing it's not just about yourself, but other people. Yeah, that, that might be useful, as opposed to what we're doing now, and that'll trigger enough people as it is. What do you mean? I don't give a damn about anybody but myself, which is the problem with the United States. That's why you must be born again. Because, yeah, that's what you are, self-centered. That's why you need Christ in there to become your center rather than yourself. That's why you must be born again. All right, so <clears throat> this is take two, by the way. Um, what I want to talk about is it's becoming more and more clear to me that there's actually, when we talk about Christianity, we're talking about two different things. The word Christianity encompasses at least two different things. And I'm going to generalize the broadest cases. Within the synoptic domain of the word Christianity, there is the common use, which is Christianity as a religious system. And most people that uh, that applies to don't usually use the word Christianity. Anyway, they use a more specific term, like if you ask them, what are you? They'll say, well, I'm a Lutheran, or I'm a Presbyterian, or I'm an Anglican, or I'm a Roman Catholic, or I'm Orthodox, or I'm Russian Orthodox, or something like that, right? That's usually how we consider ourselves, or I'm a Baptist. Um, something like that. I was raised, we didn't really refer to ourselves as Christians, we weren't Church of Christ, which is another cult, uh, sectarian uh, branch. But we referred to ourselves as Lutherans. That was our uh, religious identity, Lutherans. We're not all lumped in with everybody else that doesn't know what they know. Yeah, we're the one true church, like everybody else is the one true church, too. Yeah, um, <clears throat> except not quite as uh, insistent on that as some. All right, so... But that, that is uh, religion. That is a, uh, we have religion that is not God-made religion, although it often claims to be, but is really a religion made by man. It's a system of religion, and it has to do with what you do and what man does. So you become a Lutheran or a Catholic or a whatever, you generally, by being baptized as an infant. That's most people we're talking about here. And that is, uh, supposedly that makes you a Christian. That causes you to be regenerated, to be forgiven original sin and all kinds of other man-made doctrines. Not that regeneration is a man-made doctrine, but that water, sprinkling a baby or immersing, you know, you can immerse a baby, it doesn't make any difference. You can triple immerse a baby, it doesn't make any difference other than get the baby wet and make the baby cry. Because you, you plunge a child, uh, you know, like a two-year-old, two-week-old baby underwater, they might, they might have a reaction to that. But that's, see, it's, uh, it doesn't accomplish what they claim it accomplishes. I was not born again. How do I know? How do I know that? Because when I was born again, something happened that didn't happen then. So we have, and the Christianity as a religious system actually predates Constantine. But Constantine is a good marker because there's a transforming effect with Constantine. He, uh, Constantine made Christianity or brought in Christianity to be the the foundation for Roman society. He didn't make it the official and mandatory religion. That came a couple emperors later. 
but he brought it in as, as his preferred religion, and he he public he supported it with public money and public building projects. Um, at that time, others were not outlawed yet. That took place, you know, a couple emperors later. By 380, I believe, uh, Christianity, state Christianity, was the only lawful Christianity. And I believe Constantine's purpose was because there was no foundation. There was no moral foundation. There was no unifying principle in the Roman Empire. It was not a, an ethnic nation. It was a, a, uh, a political empire, a, a, a polis, uh, composed of all kinds of nations. And there was no unifying principle other than the force of the Roman legions, which were often fighting each other. Rome was very unstable, as history shows, including Constantine's own personal experience. Um, and so, effectively, Constantine made Christianity the foundation of civilization. It provided a moral foundation, uh, a philosophical foundation, a worldview for the Roman Empire. And then it, and the, the preferred worldview. And gradually, uh, what's called pagans, which were typically the, the rural people that were, uh, it, it, it expanded rapidly. The Christianity expanded rapidly in the cities, but the the rural regions were the most resistant, and they're they're the ones that are called were called pagans, because they still continued to worship their, their traditional gods, for quite a while. But Christianity, when it became state religion. The problem was, if it was to encompass a state, it had to be a form of Christianity that was not New Testament Christianity, which is a personal relationship with God, that where, where a person is God's handiwork. God makes you one of his children. It's not something you can do. It's not something man can do. And Christian was already, Christianity was already moving in this direction uh, as it was. But what happened was... Um, I'm not looking at that. I don't, okay, there we go. The uh, it had for for the purposes of a of providing a social foundation and a worldview, it had to be something that accommodated all the people, not just those who had a particular different kind of relationship with God that God had done in them through faith in Christ. It had to be a, relig a religion that man could do, that everybody could be brought into without exception. So you'd already said, seen the, the, the system becoming more uh, sacramental over the preceding centuries. It wasn't in the first century, but it became, began moving that direction. And baptism became salvific. And uh, the Lord's Supper became a, a, a sacrifice as like the Old sacri uh, Testament sacrifices, an ongoing thing. Um, so it was about a, a system of religion that man could do with a priesthood, and just like uh, other pagan religions or Old Testament Judaism where you had a system of men doing religious works to appease God, and you related to God through the system. And that's what Constantinian Christianity became. That's what, uh, that is the root of, of Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, which were the same thing up until uh, the 11th century, when the Great Schism occurred. There were, there were some developing differences, but you know, one spoke Greek and the other spoke Latin, but uh, you had, it was Constantinian Christianity. It was cultural Christianity. It is, was a, uh, a system that accommodated everyone in the land, unless they were Jews or Muslims. And it was something that man could do. And you were born into it, essentially. You were baptized as an infant. 
And then you perhaps were confirmed that was not necessarily present in the beginning. It wasn't believer's baptism. It was something that could accommodate everyone. So you were brought up in it, and it was beca became part of your life. It was part of civilization. It was a part of culture. It was a part of government. And because Christianity is truth, it did provide a foundation for society and government and law. However, those outward benefits of Christianity do not have the power to transform your life. Only true Christianity, a relationship with Christ himself, actually has the power to save you. So you, we saw the rise of these two different Christianities. The original one, which is a relationship with God through faith in Christ, a personal relationship. Can't be anything other than that. It's not a relationship with the institution. It's a relationship with God. And the rise of institutional Christianity, cultural Christianity, a Christianity as a religious system, especially beginning with Constantine and going onward, which dominated Christianity ever since. So you have these, the, the smaller form and the larger, uh, younger, actually, form that is, well, what we call Christendom or the Christian world or denominationalism or whatever. Uh, and there is some overlap in some places. Uh, you can be a born-again actual Christian and be part of any of the other, really. However, you will not be very comfortable there <laughs> because it's not the real thing, and you'll know it's not the real thing. You'll know it's not the real thing. You'll, you know, it's like Pope Francis. What is Pope Francis? Well, other than a pagan, what is he? He's not Jesus Christ. He's not the vicar of Christ. What, what is the connection there? Nothing. Nothing. The whole Roman Catholic, and they're the largest denomination, so this whole hierarchical system that, they, that man has built on the foundation of Christianity, but the whole system that's constructed above it is not really built on Christ. It's built on man. It's sort of floating over the foundation of Christianity. Or it's cantilevered over off the side someplace. I don't know how to describe it, but it's not Christianity. It's not the real thing. It's not New Testament Christianity. It's not the Christianity that actually will save you. It's a system of religion that is called Christianity and has some connection to Christianity. But it's not the real thing. It's just an out, has an outward semblance of Christianity. It talks about Jesus. It has images of Jesus. It has a cross. It has something that related to the Lord's Supper. And it has something that looks a little bit like baptism that they call baptism. But it's not the real thing. It's something else. It's a man-made ersatz Christianity. It's an imitation Christianity. Have you ever bought the the uh, the, the cheap ice cream that, that is uh, it's often labeled because it can't be labeled ice cream because <laughs> it's not truth? Uh, it's not, there's no cream in it. Imitation dairy product. It's a bit like Velveeta cheese. Once upon a time, it was processed cheese. You took um, reject cheese. In other words, it was cosmetically rejected, the, the big wheels, for various reasons. Malformed or imperfect or whatever, of various T types, and they blended it together and processed it and added some emulsifiers to keep it from separating and produced a Velveeta. So it was a, uh, a processed cheese product and melted well and everything else. And, but today it's not actually produced from real cheese. It is produced from other things. 
that are similar to cheese, but they've left the cheese out of it. They don't actually produce cheese and then process it anymore. So it's different. It's not the real thing. It isn't. Does anybody remember New Coke? When corporate America decided that people that bought Coke didn't know what they were they really should have. And so corporate America decided we have something better in mind. Uh, we, we, we can outdo our competition, Pepsi. Pepsi's sweeter than Coke, so, so we'll outdo our competition by making Coke sweeter than Pepsi. And so people went out there and they bought this stuff and the old Coke disappeared, so they bought this new stuff. We weren't given an option <laughs> right away. <laughs> this was... This was the equivalent of of uh, go uh, go woke go broke. This was uh, change your formulation go broke cause kind of stuff. So the first time I took a swig of that new Coke is like, Phew! it's like what is that? It's not Coke and it's worse than Pepsi. Why didn't I drink Pepsi? Because I didn't want all the sugar. But Pepsi was a whole lot better than that new swill they were bottling. And it had a bad reaction. And well, that's what, what uh, Constantinian Christianity is. It's, it's new swill. It's not the real thing. It can't save you. It's not, it, doesn't, it has not the power of God unto salvation. It has the words. It has priests. It has ceremonies. It has so-called sacraments that are supposed to give you grace. It's all something that man does, and it's nothing that God does. That's why it's not real Christianity. Real salvation is God's work. It's what God does in you, the promises of the new covenant, that God gives you a new spirit and a new heart, that God forgives all your sins, that, you have a, that he is, becomes your, truly your God, and you become his child. All, the, uh, all these are promises of God, and all these are things that God alone can do. And he can do them because of Christ dying on that cross. But true Christianity is God's work. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, onto good works, as Paul says. We are new creatures in Christ. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have become new. The old has passed away. That's what God does. But temporarily, we're still left in this body of flesh, so we have this... Suddenly, we find ourselves rather at war with God. We find ourselves at war with ourselves, the spirit and the flesh struggling against each other. So let's... Uh, so the world we have today is two Christianities. The larger is the Christianity that man built, and the smaller, the one that has a real power, the authentic, is the Christianity that's the work of God. So there's an analogy to this in Galatians chapter 4. Paul talks about this very issue, uh, and he uses a, a sort of an allegory from the Old Testament here. It's, it's, it's true, it's, but he's using it in sort of an allegorical um, form. So let's go over to Galatians chapter 4. And this whole book in Galatians is, let me, let me not look at that right away. The, the whole letter in Galatians is about the problem in the churches of, in the land of Galatia, which was sort of, let's see, uh, eastern and central Turkey today, was that uh, they had heard the gospel, they had believed the gospel, and then some teachers from Jerusalem were coming called the Judaizers who were, seem to have been sort of disciples of uh, James, uh, the brother of Jesus, uh, who were uh, zealous for the law. And they apparently thought of Christianity as a revised form of the Old Testament, uh, sort of like uh, the Hebrew Roots Movement in the United States, where it's really Gentiles trying to be Jews, but substituting Jesus for the animal sacrifices which is really Roman Catholicism, too. <laughs> you just keep sacrificing Jesus over and over again because you don't have a once-for-all sacrifice. 
Jesus does not uh, get sacrificed again and again and again, or repetitively presented to God again and again and again. No, he ascended and presented himself to the Father, and that was it. Sacrifice accepted, and it's done, it's finished. The question is, are you in him? Does his sacrifice apply to you? All right, so Paul's uh, dealing with this issue of people that were trying to have Christ and also depend on works, works of law of the law for righteousness. They were being taught by the Judaizers that they had to be circumcised also. This was resolved in the church uh, council that occurred. Uh, the, this apparently was very early in the New Testament time. But eventually, uh, Paul and others went back to Jerusalem to present this issue to the church as a whole, and the apostles in the church decided uh, unanimously that no, the Gentiles do not have to keep the law of Moses, including the law of circumcision. So let's go to Galatians chapter 4, starting at verse 22. Now, uh, Paul is going to talk about Abraham's two sons. He had a son named uh, Ishmael, which was a the son of Abraham and Sarah's bond woman, uh, her slave. Sarah was having problems having a child. God had promised Abraham a, an heir. And so Abraham and Sarah came up with a plan to help God out. So Sarah said, take my bond, uh, my, my slave, my servant, and have a child perhaps through her because I seem to be infertile. And so uh, Sarah's slave became pregnant, gave birth to a son who is, was named Ishmael, and he became the uh, the father of the Arab nations, basically. He ended up being blessed by God, too, but he was not accepted at, because he was not God's idea. He was not God's work. God waited until Abraham and Sarah could not have a child by natural means, they were way past that time, Abraham over 100, and I believe Sarah was over 90 years old. And uh, when God actually said, who visited them, uh, the parents of, of three uh, messengers came, and uh, God there announced to Abraham, uh, or to Sarah, next year at this time, uh, your wife will have a child. And Sarah laughed when she heard that. Imagine she thought it was rather amusing. She's like 90 years old and said, yeah, sure. And so God, of course, in his sense of humor, said, you shall name him Laughter because you laughed. And so that time the next year, she was and gave, did indeed give birth to a son. And that son was called the son of promise because he's the one God promised and God brought to, into, to, uh, to pass rather than Sarah and Abraham in their human wisdom and their human uh, ability bringing to pass. So we have a, contract, uh, con uh, a contrast between man-made religion, man-made uh, trying to please God versus God's promises, and God bringing man to salvation. So starting at verse 22 here, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman, by Sarah's slave and by Sarah herself. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. Now the flesh in the, in the Bible, Paul uses this word to basically mean what we all receive from Adam. We're born with this. We're born into this world of the flesh, the sarks. And that's what he's referring to. Everything that we get from Adam. Everything we get from natural birth. And he of the free woman through promise, through God's promise. See, God promised a new covenant, and Christ brought that in. So that's real Christianity is 
in uh, those who are in the new covenant. Whereas the Christianity of the flesh are those who are in the new, uh, who are Christians because of what man does through infant baptism, through confirmation, through systems that man created and put into place that would accommodate the flesh. So you don't have to be born again of the promise of God through faith to be that kind of a Christian, but to be the real kind of Christian, you ought to be born again through the promise given by God that's received through faith. Two different Christianities, two different kinds of Christians. One born of the bondwoman of the flesh and the other born through the promise given by the Spirit in Christ. Uh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic or an allegory. For these are the two covenants. He's talking about the covenant of the law here versus the covenant of, uh, of Christ. But he's talking about the issue, the particular issue here of the Galatians. Do they have to keep the law? For these are two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, the law, which gives birth to bondage, to slavery, which is Hagar. H well, that's the name of, Abra of Sarah's slave, Hagar. For Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, symbolically and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, to the physical city of Jerusalem, where the temple was when Paul wrote this letter, who is in bondage with her children, in bondage to the law, in bondage to the law of sin and death. But the Jerusalem above is free, the kingdom of God, which is the mother of us all, of all true Christians. We all belong to the, this is the church of Jesus Christ, the real church, the invisible church, because it's above. It's not of this created order. It is not of this world. For it is written, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Again, Sarah was infertile. Break forth and shout. <laughs> this is a quotation from the prophets. You who, uh, you who are not in labor, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. This is referring to a prophecy of, about Israel uh, as a nation, uh, that, that those who are desolate, referring to the prop, or a promise of the coming of, of the kingdom of God in Christ, that that will bear many more children than a, a woman might bear. So the, 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 what, what, the, uh, what God does through the Spirit in the gospel produces many more real children than, than what human beings can do naturally. Now we, brethren, as, as Isaac was, that was the, the son of the promise, are the children of promise, God's promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. So the child of promise is born according to the Spirit. The child of flesh was born according to the will of Abraham and Sarah and what they did. Even so it is now that, that the, the child that is born of the promise is persecuted by the child according to the flesh, according to man. We see this in the history of the church. In the, uh, the Great Awakening, the first Great Awakening, you had Whitfield, I'll name two evangelists, basically. There was others. But Whitfield and Wesley went out preaching. Whitfield, they were schoolmates. They were both members of the Holy Club at Cambridge or Oxford, I can't remember which school, uh, in their college years. And that was, the Holy Club was all about man-made religion, too. What you do, 
make yourself holy so God will receive you. And and Wesley, uh, he was always a little wishy-washy on that. But they went out preaching, and the message they both preached, Whitfield the Calvinist and Wesley the Arminian, the core of their message was you must be born again. God had to save you. Man-made religion, being baptized as an infant, doesn't do it. You must have real salvation with a real relationship with Jesus Christ. It must be God's work, not man's work. And because of that, they got locked out of the churches, of course, because state religion was is of man and has... And so they were saying, that stuff that they preach in the churches doesn't actually save you. <laughs> it's not the real thing. And of course they got persecuted. So you go to a store and you say, you know, this stuff you're selling here is imitation. It's false. It'll poison you. Why don't you sell the real food instead of this garbage? Are they going to be happy with you? No. Why don't you sell? Why don't you give people a real faith that'll save them and deliver them securely to heaven, rather you giving them garbage that's the work of men and telling them to trust in their own righteousness and the church rather than in Christ? You're killing them. You think it's going to? Uh, yeah, you'll be persecuted. You'll you'll be you'll have trouble for preaching that, as those two did. They were locked out of the churches. And they ended up preaching out in the fields. They gather people from all over, outcasts, especially like minors, that the churches didn't want to have anything to do with anyway, because they want the nice, clean people that give donations on Sunday. That's what they want. The, the yuppies, the young, upwardly mobile professionals, that's what they go after. By the way, that's what Rick Warren tells you to go after in his book, in his books. You go out and find the young, upwardly mobile, because they're going to be the future and a steady income for your church. And then you build a church that satisfies their desires. That's the church the flesh built. You want to know what a church like that is? Rick Warren's Saddleback Baptist Church. The church that flesh built. <laughs> Which apparently a lot of other churches... Uh, thank or is I have to mention this. There is a a oneness holiness church. Uh, what do they call themselves? United Pentecostal Church. That is not too far from where I had the bookstore. And I have to drive by that quite often, depending on how I go into town. And so this is little church on the way, uh, and there's uh, it's in town. And they put a banner out in front of the church that I saw. United Pentecostal. These are holy rollers. United Pentecostal churches are holy rollers. Literally holy rollers. I've seen it personally in some of them. Yeah. I've, I've attended several different of those once. Never more than once. Never went back again. But, uh, yeah, literally rolling around on the floor kind of thing. Oh, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So they got they claim they have the power of God. And they also if you don't if you don't speak in tongues you're going to hell. That's one another, another one of their doctrines or it was. Who knows what they're teaching now. But anyway, out in front of this this Holy Roller United Pentecostal Church. There's a banner advertising uh, celebrate recovery. Celebrate recovery, which is a Rick Warren program. So the Pentecostals are admitting they have zero power, so they're turning to the Church of the Flesh, Rick Warren's Saddleback, and Rick Warren's program called Celebrate Recovery. Because they can't actually deliver people from drug addiction and other addictions. But they think that Rick Warren can. Yeah, so they just demonstrated that yeah, again, there's evidence that Pentecostalism was always, always a scam, and it is to this day. And it always goes that way. It's just, just like the charismatic movement has gone off into what now is called the apostles and prophets. And, of course, they demonstrate that they have absolutely no connection with God when in uh, the lead-up to the 2020 election, they all the prophets unanimously prophesied that Trump would win the election. 
totally discredited themselves, but people don't care. They still go there. People love lies. They will, as long as it tickles their ears, they would rather listen to a lie than the truth, which is why we have the kind of people in office we have today. All right, so back to, to this here. Uh, nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the, the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Salvation does not ever come through our own works. It does not ever come through works of the law. It does not ever come from man-made religion. The law was given by God. And if you can't be saved through the law, you certainly can't be saved through Roman Catholicism or Pentecostalism or any other man-made religion. Lutheranism. You can't. All their priests and sacraments and everything else is nothing but vanity, empty words. They have no power that can, you can, that can deliver you from sin and the consequences of sin. They have no power to justify you. Salvation is only in Jesus Christ. And, you have to, and he must be in you personally. Only God does that. Not man. So if you're of man, of the flesh, you have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. You must be born of the spirit, as Jesus said. You must be born of the water, which is natural birth, and the spirit. It's born into this world as a human being and then saved because you're a fallen human being. Saved into the kingdom of God. So then, brethren, we're not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So we have two forms of Christianity. A man-made form, which is later and much larger, and the form of Christianity that Jesus brought into this world and died on that cross to establish. He brought in the promises of the new covenant, which is a... See, biblical Christianity is all about what God does for us and in us. It's all about his promises. It's not a, a covenant, a two-sided covenant. It's like the promises God made to Abraham. They were unconditional. They were uh, unilateral. God said, I'm going to do this. And that's what the promises of the new covenant are too. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to forgive your sins. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to take out your heart of stone. I'm going to put a new spirit in you. I'm going to put my spirit in you. And you shall all know me. And I shall be your God. And you shall be my people. These are things that God promises that he will do. And beyond that, he promises that when Christ returns, everyone who belongs to Christ are predestined to be conformed to the very image of Jesus Christ himself when he returns in his glory. We shall be all glorified in him and with him. We shall eternally be the children of God. In a final sense, thoroughly perfected in Christ. That's what we all look forward to. And that's one of the reasons, as Christians, we don't have to be perfect now. God will make us perfect then, but not until then. See, we still dwell in these flesh. We don't have to get all upset when we find out we're not perfect. Because God has left us in this state for a reason. That we would learn to trust in him rather than ourselves. Paul says that in our weakness, God's power is perfect, made perfect. Why? Because when we know that we're not able we have to turn to the one who is able. That is God. As long as we think 
we can make ourselves acceptable to God. We are totally deluded and have cut ourselves off from Christ. See, the Christianity that comes from the world, from Constantine, from society, is a system of religion. It's about what you do to make yourself acceptable to God. Through the church, through the institution of the church. Whereas real Christianity is about what God does for those people whom he has called to himself, who place their faith in him, who cry out to him to save us from ourselves. That's what we need to be saved from, ourselves. See, we are the problem that God has to save. God came into this world, Christ came into this world to save sinners. Until you see yourself as you truly are, in your need, in your rebellion against God, in your inability to make yourself acceptable, you will never cry out to him to save you. But whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord to be saved shall not be disappointed. God hears.